Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Halden. And Benjamin Halden. Kyle just said, I like I'm on holiday. And I think, I do like I'm on holiday. I wasn't sure about my hair today, guys. Basically, I had to get Kyle to do a little, a little pick. But he said, I look like I'm on my holidays. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> on that note. Oh, on du- holidays? No, double oh. program. Oh, not about holidays, basically, though. Could, could, could be just as exciting as going on holiday doing the doubles program. The Double or Nothing program is officially live on the My Coach app. I think, and I've not seen this anywhere else, I don't think anyone else ever bought out a doubles program with your actual doubles pair, or at all, for that matter. After Manchester, me and Meg spoke about doing this for My Coach, and it takes a lot of planning, you know, to create a doubles program on the app. And then after Worlds, it was basically in motion and it's live on the app and it's, you don't technically have to be doing doubles. It's amazing if you are, because there's a session there that is very specific to a session where you're working on your changeovers, you're working on like your sandbag passes, your rowers are really big one in there. As a lot of you go, I go exercise, working together as a team. Doesn't mean you can't train more often together in the week. But the only reason we set in one double session, like you specifically, we really want you to do together is because we're very aware that you don't always live very close to your doubles partner. You don't want to stress people out by doing it. Like me and Meg train together like once a week or in the run up to Worlds, like once a week. We couldn't train together all the time. And that's why we did the program the way we did. It's it's definitely an intermediate program, I'd say. We have the beginner program on the app, which Meg has already done before. So if you're a complete beginner, I would I would suggest to do the beginner one first. Like don't throw yourself in too deep. It's still such a progressive program, but the double or nothing, a little bit more intermediate. You've got six sessions a week. You've got compromise running. You've got strength work. There's four different phases. Honestly, the reason I'm smiling so much is because I think it's a fantastic program and you can get with High Rocks with my coach, it's 85% cheaper than standard industry pricing. And we actually know that for a fact because usually it'd be like 200 pounds ish or 150 for one month's worth of coaching for High Rocks. But we do it for 90 pounds for the 12 weeks. It's mm-hmm. actually, that's actually disgusting behavior. Like that is so, but we want, that, this is why we work so hard on the High Rocks section to make it, as accessible as possible because we know how many people want to do high rocks. So the coaching is there for you. I'm gonna stop talking about it because I got really excited about it, but hit the link below basically to get involved. There's hundreds of people who are doing it. It's just a great time. Great times, great yeah, vibes. I think there's quite a lot of talk about it just because it is one of the first doubles program in the high rock space. In uh, the world. Ian, Ian K messaged me the other day, the guy who runs the, the fitness racing podcast, asking if he could talk about it on his podcast because it was unique. Really? So. I think it's it's definitely a program that will be unique and one that you've not seen before. Like we mentioned previously, it is faster times, interval work, and some sessions with your partner as well. So great for working with somebody else on it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Harrock's done. (laughs) Done. Tick. Off the show notes. Do you think there is such a thing as toxic positivity? Was that a question to me or the audience? To you. To me. I mean, it's kind of similar to like the whole toxic positivity vibe, isn't it? Can you be too positive? Can you be too productive? I believe you can get caught in the culture of toxic positivity, productivity, sorry, they sound very similar. And I do think you can because you almost guilt trip yourself to be thinking I should be progressing all the time because everyone else is and I should be doing things 24 seven. And if not, you feel guilty. I think the feeling of guilt over not working enough or pushing forward and progressing, I think that can be toxic because you can lead to burnout, which I will actually speak about today at some stage. But the pressure to always be doing something and moving forward, ironically, makes you not productive. So I do think it is a thing, a statement, a yeah, a cultural norm maybe in today's society. Yeah, I was I've reference there on my show notes about it being along the sort of debate we've had in in terms of toxic positivity but i don't think it is the same thing i th- i don't personally believe you can really have too, too much toxic positivity i think no, I'm not even, even if you're in a negative headspace and you force positivity upon yourself or you force yourself to have a smile it puts you in a better headspace anyway because you're you're trying to be positive and I think we had this, we I think we spoke about this topic with 
Rob Lipset quite a few years back on the podcast. And he was the one that first sort of made me aware of that notion that he didn't think there was any such thing as it because the simple be the simple place of trying to be more, more positive is positive in itself. And I think it's definitely one of those things which is maybe more of a UK culture where we're a lot more pessimistic, I think. Maybe this is me making massive generalizations, but I always feel when I go to America, there's a lot more optimism. I don't think you can yeah. ever be too too. You can never be too optimistic. I think the more optimism, the better. Yeah, I, I agree to an extent. Sometimes then, when someone's so optimistic, I don't think it's negative. I think it's great. And I love people who are. I mean, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> when some people are so optimistic, though, it's like you do you. That is wildly optimistic. You do you. You keep thinking that way. Um, it's not always negative, but sometimes it can be so. I mean, I, I guess maybe a little bit unrealistic sometimes. Do you know what? But it's not H- a bad hits thing. me straight away. It's even with the Euros at the moment. We must ha- must have the most pessimistic nation. There's been, I think, even other, other countries in the Euros actually commented on how negative the English fans are towards the team, despite the fact that we finished top of the group qualified and then we just won the previous knockout mm. stage and we're now at the the semi final. I think there is a there is a notion and there is evidence to say that we we are either pessimistic or can be very negative in our own culture. From what you said before, I was just trying to research it at the same time. I think that is actually it's scientifically proven that even if you force a smile, yeah, it does help you feel better. I we spoke about this. It must have been like a couple of years ago, actually. I just remember it ever since. Sometimes if I'm on a run or I'm just training or I'm in a really bad mood, I will literally sit there by myself. <laughs> force myself to smile and it doesn't people yeah. must be going past you like what a weirdo you I are do. No, I she trying to smile or she's shitting herself I make sure no one's running towards me but it's sometimes actually I do if I'm not feeling the best I will really force myself to smile and I do think it works and there is science behind it. I can't find the exact research papers but there is science behind forcing yourself to smile and trying to just not accept that you're in a really bad mood or whatever it is and you can you can you can fake Smile, and sometimes it actually will get you out of the uh, the feelings. Well, it's the whole happiness equation, isn't it? That that mm. Mo Gaudet referenced that you you can't be unhappy and happy at the same time. So if you're forcing yourself to be happy, therefore you're you're pushing out the notion of being unhappy. I, I get the the argument sometimes. You know, when someone is super super over the top positive, mm. and it maybe doesn't fall in with their usual characteristics, and you're in a shit mood, and like that pisses you off. But that's more of a you problem than a yeah. Problem. But anyway, that's, that's positivity we're talking about. We are today talking about toxic productivity. So some of the signs I've referenced of toxic productivity would be obsession with self-improvement above anything else. It does not matter how productive you are. You always feel you could have done more. And for that reason, you then feel guilty about it. That's one of the ones that I definitely feel quite often I, I reflected on this, this the other day, sorry, when we, I think it was actually a week ago today, I did and went and shot some content with Jake Dearden and then we came here to do the podcast. So I'd spent my day writing content and filming and when I have a day where I'm not doing admin sat at the laptop, it m- makes me feel really guilty and I feel like I haven't been productive because I haven't got anything tangible to show here's the work that I've done. That's one of my real... I suppose guilty traits. I remember you got back that day. You did you did that the morning. You came back. We filmed a podcast. Then how we had I think we all had a meeting. And then at the end of the day you're like, oh, I've just had like a really unproductive day. And I think I lost my shit a bit. I was like, I swear to fucking God. I was like, just because you're not sat behind that laptop. I was like, you've had one of the most productive days. I was like, oh, part of our job is being out there doing this. Too. I think that's why I'm very like, <laughs> I don't get that at all. Like I just don't, I just don't get that feeling you get and I said to you I was like oh my god you've had like the most productive day ever like just because you didn't sit there and you physically had a laptop in hand all the time it doesn't mean you weren't productive you were just productive in like a different realm of one of your like your job roles maybe this stems back and I don't want to go too much into it but from one of the the, the previous employees and partners we had in the business of comments where I would go out a lot and do things forward facing for the business and it would be received with negative comments back mm. oh yes i think maybe it's deeper rooted into that um and it's always made me feel guilty and i've just kind of 
always move forward. Maybe there's other people that's, that feel the same way then when you don't have tangible work to show for what you've done, you feel guilty about it. And uh, the other things are working to the extent you harm your health or relationships, mm -hmm. relentless and unrealistic expectations, difficult in rest or relaxing. I think that's one that I get that we, we both definitely struggle with. <laughs> It reminds me of the other day when I was sat on the couch having lunch and Kyle was like, <laughs> you literally had the deli on for five minutes. I was like, I ate my lunch, I walked to the deli and it was off. Like I, I was done. I was like, I can have a five minute lunch break and then I'm back to work. I don't know what that is with me. Like I very much need to just put the telly on five minutes, eat my lunch and I'm done. And I think it was like five minutes and Kyle was like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> like you've not even taken a second. So I really struggle with just not needing to do all the time. And then the other one is the the cultural problem, mm -hmm. the need to show up and be seen or you will be forgotten. So that's the one that I think stems more to social media. And I even, it, you know, for example, this is how maybe to some people it will sound pathetic because if you're not in our space, you wouldn't understand it. But even if I've got no stories, but of that day, I feel like, oh, fuck, I put nothing, nothing up today. People like uh, people will forget that like, I'm here or mm -hmm. people will be getting ahead of me. You know, that zero sum game fallacy even things like that stress me out. And if it's a pressure to always feel like you need to show up and be seen. Yeah, that's quite weird. Actually, I've never thought about that. I, I feel like I always at least have one thing. And if I, if something wasn't up, I'd be like, I mean, it's also weird though, because people message being like, mm. are you okay? And I'm thinking, I'm a sat with my kittens. I'm having a great time. I'm not even, you don't even realize. And then like, oh my God, I've not done a story. And you, you go on and think, oh, sorry guys, I've been, yeah, that's the other thing, apologizing. <laughs> Sorry, I've been with my kitten. <laughs> yeah, people like... apologize. Like people generally don't give a fuck if you're not showing up. People won't even realize. But sometimes you can get in your own head about things and not not have context. Um, one question I wanted to ask you both. Gosh. Answer it either way. What What is productivity to you? Go on, Liz. I'll let you go on that one. Productivity to me is setting myself a task or a goal and achieving it. That is bam, I'm being productive. I've set myself a task. I will finish that task. Okay, Cal? Yeah, I think it's just moving towards your goals, right? Whatever it is, I can be productive in non-work tasks. Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm moving towards something that I want, productive. Productive day. Yeah. What about you, Ben? I, I was thinking about this before, and there's a, there's a few things that, these are just immediate things that fire in my mind and maybe they resonate to other people, but it wasn't so much of a definition. It was more, I think, books, information, education, consuming things, and then trying to implement them. Um, and I think that that's what always comes to my mind. And then I, I was thinking about it and I thought, We've got all this education, like, you know, we're kind of in this information age, aren't we, where we've got an abundance of it. And that's what I think is the is the issue that I'm, I'm sometimes try, trying to take in so much. And I think, but what were people doing before we even had the internet and things? And what were people doing with productivity before we had mm. podcasts and the internet and these other things? Because one of the things that they probably did more of, and I like to do as much as possible, is, is me search. So like your own experience of things and failing and, and learning. Cause I think that's where so much actually comes from in terms yeah. of self-development and productivity, you finding out things mm -hmm. about yourself, because the one thing that really kills me with productivity is the ex expectations of what I'm supposed to be doing really feels heavy and crushes me sometimes. It's because and I looked into this toxic productivity is often confused with success and it's an accepted form of stress and an example of unhealthy boundaries in our culture. And I thought that was really interesting because it's seen as a badge of honor and it's glamorized and there's nothing wrong with being successful, productive and proficient. But when it comes at the expense of your health, that's when it becomes a problem. There's success and toxic productivity when it becomes detrimental to your mental health, your physical health, your stress levels that is toxic productivity and that is not actually helping you to be successful towards your goal so it's really difficult actually i think to have that boundary of am i am i working towards my goal to be successful if you look at success in that way 
or is this having a detrimental effect on like my mental health? I think we've all had that. I've had physical effects, 100% of toxic productivity, which goes into burnout is what a lot of people call it. Call it. I've never experienced it until quite recently. And I just think it's really difficult for us because I think success and toxic productivity are so intertwined. That's really interesting because I was thinking about this before and I think it's probably one of the most difficult things. Yeah. And I was actually thinking about someone that I really like and it was Alex Hormozzi. Mm-hmm. Anyone would see him as a successful businessman. But if you took his success away, would he then just be a man who's got toxic productivity? I don't think one works without the other. Do you think? Oh, I don't know. You, Ooh, are, that was a bold statement for me. I don't are, know that's true. <laughs> are you simply toxic, toxically productive until you reach success and then it's seen as something else? Ooh. Ooh, I don't know. Oh, well, what is that gets in that whole realm of what is success to you? And it's really difficult because of success to me. Like success to me is having freedom and happiness. Yeah, but homeless people are free and happy. Mm-hmm. They're not successful. Yeah, see, that's, well, yeah, financial success also comes into it, having financial freedom, maybe. So, Ben, you're saying that that's really difficult. It's only toxic when it's not working. Well, it can be working, but you just haven't achieved the success that you're destined to get. I think right. the thing that I was thinking about as well is even with, with sports stars, a lot of people laughed at people like Tyson Fury and he thought he's a bloody idiot and a, you know, a jippo and all these kind of things. They labeled him as until he became the heavyweight world champion. I see. And a lot of the time until we got the title or won the thing or banked the cash, then you're viewed as weird or toxic or overworked and then we get the the medal for it and it's like champion i had that i know exactly what you're describing I mean, for uni people are like you're so boring you're obsessed with work you're this you're that three years later oh will you post this for me oh my god you're doing amazing so they don't see me now as the like the obsessive girl at uni when i wasn't going out drinking i was up at six and i was working really late till 10 i probably did have toxic productivity then but it was very much labeled in that way as well that I was obsessive and I was this and I was bored. Um, I was not bored. I was uh, boring. Whereas now it's looked in a really different light, but I still probably work in the exact same manner. It's just the uh, very interesting um, topic. But then again, like it's that whole thing of, I think anyway, with social media, we know so much about each other nowadays. Anyone online, you know everything. You don't know everything about them, but you know a lot about other people. And the famous saying, which I still think is a great saying, is the comparison is the thief of joy. Because you're you're not just comparing to maybe physically what someone looks like, and that is obviously a natural human thing that we all do. You're comparing to what others are doing, the consumption of busyness and achievements, rather than just like physically what they're looking like or what fitness goals they're achieving or whatever it is, you're also seeing through social media how much people are doing. Like I imagine if I sometimes, like if I've ever done like a story before and I've listed like my to-do list, sometimes it's like astronomical and I put it out there and not even thought none the wiser. But somebody might look at that and think, oh my God, she's so busy. She's so productive. I should be that busy and I should be that productive because I'm also a personal trainer or a business owner. So we have access to everything on social media i don't know if that's our fault as creators when we share things i don't necessarily think it is because it's yeah that's i like sharing things like that and what we're up to but i think social media is an absolute killer for toxic productivity in terms of like comparing to what other people are achieving I don't think we do know everything about other people. I think that we like to think that we know a lot about other people, but in real, mm. real, realistically, we only see two percent of what people are really doing. That's what, yeah. Sorry, that's what I mean. They see like the highlights and a lot more of the good things, and we post about it a lot. Yeah, and and this is where it's difficult because I I do agree. Social media is such a real burden on this, but at the same time, it's great because sometimes it gives me a kick up the arse that I need to go and do something instead of sitting there procrastinating. So again. It's- as a consumer, you've got to try your best to filter things as best as possible. Mm-hmm. But I think 
some people handle this sort of thing a lot better, particularly people like Alex Hormozzi when we're referencing productivity and success because I personally tie a lot of my self-worth to success, which isn't always a good thing. And I get I get that being a, a business owner, this is something that comes as part of the territory. And yeah, I accept that wholeheartedly. But it's kind of like when people say, oh, it's so, it's great for you because you can do what you want with your work there. You can train when you want. You can take time off when, whenever you want. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the complete opposite to that. Like I probably take less time off than the average person. I work way longer hours than the average person. I, I, I only really take a holiday once per year. And the other trips that we go and that a lot of people see, they're work trips. So it actually doesn't feel like you're on holiday as glamorous as it often often looks. And don't get me wrong, I wouldn't change it for the world. I love what we do. We're just speaking about potentially some of the things that we're subconsciously not thinking about, mm -hmm. which stress can creep into your life through these avenues. Um, because if someone asked me right now, what would you rather be doing? I spoke about this the other day with you and me on a walk. I couldn't name anything else that I would rather be doing. So it's doing things that you have to do and doing things that you want to do the, the it's it's i think it's difficult to, to navigate through sometimes i think it's the lack of sh like lack of structure like we have structure we have structure we all work and we know what needs to be done and we have this but in terms of you drive and you get into work at nine o'clock and then you switch off your computer at five <laughs> it just does not exist it doesn't exist at all and we'll we'll be here there and everywhere and it's amazing and it's so exciting I think it's probably quite good that we both work together because when it does get to eight o'clock, me and Ben introduced a rule quite a long time ago. If we're still upstairs in the office at 8 p.m., we can literally go in and shut the person's laptop. As in, not shut the laptop at 8 p.m. because we used to be really, really horrendous for it. We used to sit up till 10 o'clock. Both of us on our laptops not saying anything. Like, oh God, it's 10 o'clock. We need to go to bed. We pulled each other up on that because there's just no, there's no, there's no time frame for what we do. It's just, you're here, there and everywhere. You're working at this time. You're doing that. Oh, this has come up. You're doing this out of hours. Is it out of hours? Is it out of hours? Because we have our own time. That's where it becomes difficult. I think being a business owner, because you're constantly wanting to push your business forward. Of course you are. You want your business to be successful. So you'll do as much as you can to do that. When we first started the company, Ben, it was that was the most toxic productivity period I've you ever been be through. There. You have to be during yeah, that no, period. Absolutely. We were up at five. We train, we'd film, we'd shoot things for my coach school, website subscription at the time. We'd work all day, do calls in the office and we'd leave at like 11 o'clock at night and then we'd do it again. And I think that was a necessity at that moment in time, but people would view that as toxic productivity, but I view it as that's just what we needed to do in that, in that moment. Um, so it is really difficult, I think, more because we have to be quite strict with each other being like, come on, we need a bit of us time, like laptops down, phones down is a really big one, scrolling and just being accountable to each other. But I guess if you don't have that accountability, buddy, it can definitely get a little bit ropier and harder. Yeah, I think even people who are working um, in a nine to five or in a job as well, a lot of people have other things that they want to progress with, whether that's a health and fitness journey, whether that's a side hustle, whether that be working on something at home, developing something at home, building something at home. Trying to find the time to do other things is, is difficult. I, I was asking myself before, like, am I in a relationship with product, toxic productivity? Or am I just doing what I love? Am I going to live to regret it? Or am I gonna, would I live to regret not trying? When's it going to stop? Is it when I have kids? Is it when I'm on my deathbed? These were the questions that I was trying to ask myself before. And there's not a lot of times I, I was thinking about this before and it's probably quite sad for people to hear, but there's not a lot of times I do things just because I enjoy doing them. Yeah. Even Even yesterday, so you weren't here. I'd finished doing work for the day and I had an hour or two spare. And I was quite tired and people might think, oh, I might go and watch TV or I might go and have a sleep. 
or I might go and do such and such a thing. My brain automatically goes to what can I do within this one to two hours, which is going to better me. And a lot of the time, like recently that's been, I'll go back into the gym. I'll do mobility or stretching because I know that's going to benefit me fitness wise. Yesterday I went, okay, I'm going to go into the sauna because recovery wise, I'll be better tomorrow. And don't get me wrong. I love being in the sauna because there's a lot of mental health benefits from that as well. But my brain automatically, automatically goes to what can I do to make me better or to make my environment? But it never just goes, what can I do? Because I really enjoy doing that. Very, very rarely happens, even sometimes on the weekend. And I think that's why I love go into Disney so much because that is a com- that's just one thing that I really enjoy doing and mm-hmm. I'm a complete switch off with it I was really digging into it before and I do it all the time when I've got free time I think what can I put in that one to two hours in the evening which is productive do you feel the same way Liz? I don't know I was trying to, I mean I feel like there's all yeah what like, do you do for fun in a week that you don't like try and <laughs> monetize not monetize but I mean like monopolize with socials and stuff is there anything I FaceTime my mum. That's actually the only thing I can think when I was thinking, oh my God, what do I actually do? That's not, that I just love doing to do it. I'm either on the phone to Megan and we chat about life or I'm on FaceTime to my mum or I'm with the, with the munchinator. I'm mini, but she won't go nowhere near us. Um, Yeah. So actually the kittens have been a really great thing for me mentally just to switch off because when Munch is crawling all over you, you don't want your phone. You don't want anything. You just want to stroke him and hold him and love him. Uh, Mini, you can look at from a distance. But that's like the only thing, like FaceTiming mum or dad or Meg or, yeah, or the kittens. Even like we're like, oh, we'll go for a walk. In my head, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe we'll just hit step count. Do you know what I mean? Like that's all like, a thing I yeah, automatically exactly think. step count, yeah. It's, gen- it's generally one of those things that causes so much conflict in my brain because I'm thinking that and then I think... But for enjoyment, am I then taking on what other people believe is enjoyment to them or social norms and expectations from other people, i.e. some people might enjoy gardening, so they see that as a, an enjoyable task. Some people might enjoy going to the pub or go and take golf balls. And am I taking on those social norms of what I should be doing versus doing the things that I do at the moment, which I think that I enjoy? I don't know. It causes honestly so much conflict in my, in my brain. I definitely think for you, I think like the sauna is definitely, you love doing that. Like that's, it does obviously help recovery. You can't not. It's like me being on FaceTime to my mum, you could say boosts my serotonin, yeah, makes you feel better. So it's not, I think the sauna is a great one. Like you actually do love doing it and you love just sitting in there and being with your own thoughts. Like I make sure that I see Lauren every single week and we have Loz and Lucy night. Like I see my best friend every week because that's really important to me. I don't see it as I'm improving my mental health. I just... I want to spend time with her and I want to see her. So it's not, I think you just have it in your head that it's like, oh, but if I'm, well, even like stretch mobility, that's a great thing to do. That's a nice thing to do. I don't know what, what else do people do? I think people just sit and watch telly I think and we don't do that. Hobbies, right? Yeah, hobbies. Yeah. My hobby is my kitten. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't, like my hobbies would be, like if I could go on a random hike, I see that as a hobby of an evening. I don't know. I, yeah, are we, all these reading? Uh, again, uh, the other thing that comes into my, my brain is, is this, all these sacrifices of running and wanting to run a successful business and wanting to be like a, a fairly high level athlete. But then like we have date night every week. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That, and that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. I'm, I'm more so, these are just questions that I, I'm, I'm in conflict with in, my mind and there's 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 two different sides to things and that's what often causes conflict for me i mean you don't i feel like people don't always need to have stuff remember i bought my whole baking set <laughs> thought baking was gonna be my new hobby clearly it's not um and i just thought i need to do something in this time when i'm just like not doing anything so i bought a bright pink baking set to bake cookies and cakes I fucking don't like cooking or baking really. And I just thought I needed to, I need a hobby because everyone says you need to have a hobby. Fuck me. I'm not an absolute like weirdo who doesn't have hobbies. I just, one of my biggest hobbies and passions in life is fitness. A lot of things fall into that realm. The sauna, the recovery, going on walks. It, so it's really hard. So the baking thing didn't work out, but I've got a, I've got an interest in rom-com novels at the moment. Don't I, I just, I can just sit in a corner and read a book. Is that a hobby? Or are people like, oh, you're reading. So it's, 
don't know. What is a hobby? What I think that's a, a, a positive thing because I think when I first met you guys, Luce, you were talking quite negatively about any kind of reading that wasn't yeah. self-help books. It's progress. Yeah. I actually did, didn't I? Like, I feel like I'm not progressing unless I'm reading. Like in the morning, I will read a businessy style book. But sometimes in the day, I'm like, I'm going to have half an hour with Colleen Hoover and I'm going to sit and I'm going to I'm going to read through through a book. So, yeah, that's maybe. But no, it's a really interesting. Well, Cal, yeah. what are your hobbies? Yeah, photography. I just like go out. Yeah, I'll but just could, go would to... you not say that's job? Part yeah, but job. I mean, I'm a lot. I mean, I'm shit at posting. I'm getting way better. I've got a load. Uh, Follow Cal Hibbard. Stuck up. Um, but yeah, no, photography is a big one. Obviously, taking Dante out for big walks. It's a big one, but that's not that much of a hobby hobby. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm bad at it. I, I don't think you guys should feel bad that the thing that you spend the majority of your time happens to be the thing that you have made your career. I think that's a very good point. I don't think yeah. that just because you've monetized it very, very fucking well takes away from the enjoyment of it. Yeah, I, don't, I know people who've got like what I would call quote unquote hobbies. And just because it's something that they don't make money off doesn't mean that it's better. Yeah, that. Like, you know fuck. why as well? It's difficult because sometimes actually every single time without fail if i do an ask a question box people are like what are your hobbies aside from fitness i'm thinking it makes me feel bad that i don't know that immediate answer i'm like i don't know my family and my cats mm. and it makes me feel bad or awkward that i don't have this perfect well, answer sweat, are you <laughs> that i don't have this perfect answer and i just it reflects on me and i just i think a lot of the times when i do spare hours i think about what is going to make me feel better that, and that's what I often tend to do with my time. DFB. What's that? Disney food blog. Yeah, I, I watch that sometimes. But <laughs> it's even, someone asked me a question on Instagram yesterday saying, don't you get bored of just eating steak? And like, one, no, I don't. I, I actually feel really good, really good <laughs> off it. And two, I often eat for how I want to feel, not just what I want to get immediate satisfaction from. Mm -hmm. And if you want to achieve anything, you've got to do things that you sometimes don't want to do. You often got to do things that you don't want to do in the form of delayed gratification <laughs> or doing the, the difficult thing now to get the better thing in the future. And that sometimes ties into some of the, the actions that I take day to day as well. But the question I also wanted to ask you both is... Oh, we, I, these questions really is a head thinker today. Yeah, this is the, this is the other one because I think about this sometimes in the morning as well. Do you start the day on green or red? <laughs> Are we basing this off science with my whoop? <laughs> no, I, I'm, no, it's nothing to do with whoop. God, sort of plug for Lucy Davis whoop. Um, it's, do you feel you're starting the day at neutral or do you feel like you're starting the day behind and you're playing catch up? I used to think I was on red and playing catch up because I used to really stress about getting up in the morning and then I'd always go on my laptop and I'd do emails and I'd be really stressed about it and I'd start the day in the wrong way. Now, I get up after Ben also and I used to really struggle with that. Ben just gets up earlier. I go up at 6.45, sometimes 7. Sometimes um, this morning was 7.30. Sometimes 7.30 was this morning. And I shouldn't feel bad about that. Fuck me. It used to honestly make me feel so bad. Ben's there 5 a.m. and I'm thinking, I need two and a half more hours in bed. But I never judged you for it, though. No, no, but I judged myself. I really judged myself from it. And I thought, oh, my God, why aren't I Why aren't I up at 5 o'clock and doing the ice bath and standing on the grass and grounding? And I just, it was not in me and getting off my laptop straight away. And I always used to compare what, to what Ben was doing. Now, on a good day... I'm up at 6.45. Ben leaves the door open, so Munch usually comes in and wakes me up, and I love it, and it's the best thing ever. I have, I have a moment with him. And then go downstairs, have my coffee. I read a little bit. I just chill. And then I train, or I run. And it's still enough time for the working day, but now I do not get up, and I don't go on that laptop. And it and I wake up green, because I'm not stressed now when I get up, and it's just I'm honestly in so much a better headspace. I used to wake up stressed when my alarm went off every day. Every day. What you call? Um, I used to very much be a morning person, so I'd wake up feeling super green. Mm -hmm. uh, we recently had a bit of a chat actually about like my stress levels mm -hmm. and how it's kind of impacting a few bits. Um, and yeah, I've realized that my dog, as much as I love him to death, I don't remember the last time I slept in past 5.30, genuinely. It's probably been, well, it was when I was on holiday. But then prior to that, when I'm home, I just don't sleep. Yeah. Um, I'm probably averaging like five hours or a bit less, a bit more, sorry. 
a, a day. And yeah, it's really starting to stress me out. And I, I do, I start the day fucking red. Like I get up and Dante's sneezed all over the walls and I've got to clean them up and I've got to feed him, take him out for a walk, blah, blah, blah. And it's great when I'm out, but I do feel very red. And then I get back and I've not done anything except focus on my dog for an hour and 15, 20 minutes. And then I've got to crack on with the rest of the day. Yeah. So yeah, I feel pretty red at the minute. Definitely. Yeah, I think, about you? I think I'm just because the role... I take some time with things and tasks I have to do in the morning or sometimes very urgent or very responsive to what's come in. I sometimes feel like I'm behind and I have to get to green and it takes, that's a lot of the time I think why I start work at 6am is because I feel like I'm playing catch up with some of the things. So that levels me out then and then I can train and then I can do the, then I can get back to my other bits of work. So I often do feel like I start a day at red and that's not physically start a day at red. That's me as in I've got catch up to play with. Uh, and a lot of the time that's again, because we service so many people from different countries around, around the world that we get a lot of different things that come in uh, and a lot of different inquiries that come into me via email from all different time zones. And that sometimes feels like a bit of pressure on me to, to then get back to them in sufficient time. Yeah, I definitely used to have that. I think with, like with the app, because there's a lot of personalized elements. I mean, we do have more coaches now and it's it's amazing. But I used to get really stressed. So on the app, which is an amazing feature, you can request personalized calories and macros. And I used to think I had to give it to the person within an hour if it came in. If I didn't, I was failing them and they didn't have it and they'd be really disappointed. When actually it's three working days and it always has been on the app. And I used to be really stressed thinking, oh my God, people are going to be so disappointed or... They're going to want their plan within an hour of signing up. And I thought, actually, the reason that we lay stuff out in a certain way for the business is so they have three working days. And we, as coaches, it gives ourselves enough time. And you want the product to be amazing and good. And I think when I switched the mindset of having to do something immediately, the very second, or like of a morning, I, I used to be so, oh, God, I have to get all these tasks done before seven or eight o'clock in the morning or I failed my whole day and I, I just I've moved away from it completely now and I'm just you know I think it's a very good thing that I did I think you, one of your toxic productivity traits is that you feel once you've started something Ooh, you've got issue. you've got to get it done and it causes I had therapy for that conflict sometimes and issues because there's n you actually don't even have a, a time or a date you know to finish something but it doesn't matter how many hours it takes you once you've started it you've got to finish it that is actually a real issue. I don't know if it's, I had, do you remember I had therapy for it? Because I, so what Ben's basically describing, if I had a task, if, if I needed the toilet, if I needed to, I would not it move. It was wasn't it? Yeah. I wouldn't move for six or seven hours, as in physically not move, not eat, not drink, not go to the toilet. I still do it now. Sometimes I'm getting better. Not, yeah, and, but, but people could speak to me and I'm like, I'm gone. I'm literally gone. Like if I'm not finishing something and it's actually a really bad trait and I do try and work it all the time. Therapy actually didn't help that much. I feel like they just didn't know what to say to me in terms of, they're like, just shut your laptop. I'm thinking really unhelpful, really unhelpful advice to, do you know what, to someone who's actually in a really rough area of toxic uh, productivity. And it is something I struggle with. I think maybe a lot of people do have that. I don't think that's just a me thing. Like you set yourself a task and you don't want to move until it's done. I know I've not set myself a time frame, but it's almost like I feel uncomfortable until it's done and I physically won't move. Really bad trait, working on it, working on myself. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up and Kyle had actually popped a note about this, I think is so interesting, is the four day work week. And they have been found to increase productivity, happiness and decrease stress. And there's been a lot of different studies on this. So working four days a week, I'm Isn't assuming- quite big in Scandinavia. Yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um boosts productivity by 40 percent. So there's a lot of reports microsoft japan introduced a four-day work week and that was the one that boosts productivity by 40 percent. and then similar results from global trials and i just think it's a really interesting concept that i think yeah a lot of scandy com um, companies and countries did bring it in i don't know if they still do it i'm not 100 percent sure but so does it mean if you did a four hour work week, you'd work. Not four hour work week. Sorry. It's not, it's not Ryan Holders. Sorry, but... that's the book. Fucking fantastic. Imagine that. Um, no. So does it mean you're working the four days you start early and end later? 
Or do you just completely cut out a day? Because to me, you're losing the whole, that's a lot of time just to Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Okay. Uh, in uh, some councils in the Southeast at the minute, there was trials for the four day work week where they do, they just, you come in an hour earlier, you leave an hour later and you just get all your work done during the time. But the ones that I'm highlighting here are where, where it's called four days work for five days pay. And that is, yeah, you do, uh, I think it's 32 hours a week. Mm. Um, and you, yeah, I paid for the full 40 and people that, that extra eight hours of saving is, um, yeah, just made up for by uh, increased productivity. People are taking less pointless meetings because they know they've got less hours during the day. So there's immediate savings there in a lot of big companies. Um, and yeah, people are just a lot more focused, grateful and motivated to work. I suppose on a, on an acute level, it's, it's similar to having the time that I sometimes have on my desk, I can set it to 40 minutes. And I'll get all the stuff done in those 40 minutes because you will usually complete the task in the allotted time that you have. And if you make that time a lot longer, you'll use the full amount of time to get the task done. So I'm guessing that's the same principle that it, yeah. it sort of falls upon. Uh, interestingly, along the same lines as well, we've recently just been to Malta. And one of the things that they do, and I was asking the guy who was picking us up from the airport to take us to the uh, retreat why the roads and stuff are so busy and it's because everybody was finishing for summer mm -hmm. so i think they had was it eight or 12 weeks off for summer yeah so they, they had like work. three they had three yeah. can let me explain it. i think it's uh, they had three months off for summer i don't know if you'll google it now carl because all through winter they work an extra two or three hours every day and they bank all that time and in the summer they get it was either half day. Oh, it was half days. They worked from 8 a.m. till midday, which is why the road's so busy because everyone's going home. So they don't get 12 weeks off. They work half days through the mm -hmm. summer because they get them worked on in the morning early. And then they also get the full afternoon off where it's super hot as well. Yeah, It's probably like Spain, right? Where people just take little siestas during the day because yeah. it's just so hot. I'd never heard of it before, though. Yeah. It's, it was really interesting that people could bank the hours through the winter and take them in the... The summer and just do a nine till till twelve. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it, also very hot. It, I think as well. I don't think that would work for every company because obviously some companies rely on doing things later in the yeah. yeah. In I, the day. I don't think the four day work week works, for example, with doctors. Like you want them to yeah, be working yeah. five days a week. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> can't there's some be professions. On a Friday. But yeah, there's some professions. Like imagine all the police. which you going to take Friday off now? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's some professions where obviously it wouldn't work with you. But I, I understand the concept of it. And apparently, where it's tried, it just stays. People are just, yeah. yeah, it's transformatory for... Well, it, it just, again, how how many years ago did we si decide the five-hour work week, working Monday to Friday was yeah. the thing, and we just stuck to it because it was, that's what was said is the, the done thing. Mm. Just quickly back to social media. Um, Sorry, I had a question for you. Sorry, go on. You can, you can do social media first you want, and then it's actually a question. Kind of not about socials. Okay. Well, the, the only thing I was going to about so, social media, and again, we we spoke about being a, a negative, and again, it, it can be in in the way that it's utilized, and I think that's because subconsciously, you always feel like there's someone out there doing more than you. But when is it? When is it too much? And when will we realize that this is too much? And I think you, you can go online and always see someone training or you can always see someone doing work or you can always see someone creating content and that's what creates for me the negative headspace with it sometimes because it's it's subconscious just leaking it. Why are you looking at that? Sorry. Because I'm thinking. Oh, sorry, I was just thinking. Like, <laughs> sorry, it's going to come across me, but like, fuck now, yeah, there's always people who are better than us. Always. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's and I'm the... just, I, I was going to go, duh. <laughs> like fucking hell. Like in my head, I just thought then, why do we look at it like that? Because, oh my God, of course, there's hundreds and Always thousands people, of people yeah. who are way more successful. And it's, that's never not going to be a thing. So maybe when we all accept that, you can probably just be okay with it because you will never go on social media and not see people doing things. Yeah, because there's always and you someone. Follow aspirational people. There's always someone training. There's always someone working. We're, we're always seeing things uploaded, like the Hoobman podcast clips of him grounding his feet. And I tried that. Talking about okay. exposure and 
we think shit, I'm not doing that. And do you know what? Guess what? Neither are they that time. It's it's a pre-recorded clip from probably a week ago, so they're not probably doing that at the moment either. So don't start worrying about that you need to go out and do something as well, which I think creates a lot of pressure. But also if they were, there are people who <clears throat> are better than us in life. There are people who are faster, stronger, more successful, richer, prettier. Oh my God, the list goes on. And maybe if we just accept that a little bit more, you won't just look at everything like as a negative. Sorry, my brain's gone off on a well big tangent there because it's like, it's so obvious to us. So obvious. Is it not obvious? We, we follow inspirational, <clears throat> aspirational people. I would be shocked if I went on my social media and didn't see like Hormozy posting something or this or that because I choose to follow people who are like better than me and like faster in it every way. They're better than me in every way. And it doesn't mean I'm not a good person. Don't say that. They're not better than you in every way. Don't say stuff like that. No, just in, in terms of like, I met in all the different, different areas. Someone will be faster. Okay. Someone will be more financially better off. Someone will have a more successful business. Someone will have... Whereas I shouldn't look at them and think, sorry, yeah, sorry, I meant they're not better than that. We're just all right, at different you. stages. And But I follow them for inspiration. So maybe that's what we should all do. Also, I'm thinking about myself here, like out loud. So that's what social media is. I think sometimes if we accept it, as you said, there will constantly be something there. It's okay. We it's, just it's, it's difficult to do though, isn't it? Because like we spoke about in last week's episode, our brain and our DNA evolution, we evolutionarily in, well, sorry, in evolutionary psychology, we are geared up to compete with those who are around us. That's the mm. way that we've evolved over years. And that's the way that our survival instinct has worked. So the only difference now is that we are surrounded digitally by hundreds of thousands of other people who you think you need to compete with. So it's, it's built deep within us and it's a really difficult thing to start to have self-awareness on. And this is the the biggest difficulty that it's been the underlying tone of the entire podcast is how can we be content whilst also still wanting self-development? But I think I also had that self-awareness moment just then. Yeah, but how, think... how can you have it con without us talking about it? How can it be ingrained within your brain that that's your subconscious response to thinking about those kind of things? I just, fucking hard oh it's very hard i get that and w i mean even me being there just blurting out what exactly my brain was thinking that might be a way of me just dealing with it like i'm choosing to follow these aspirational people because i think they're all amazing and incredible and i look up to them doesn't mean that i'm doing something wrong i'm just not where they are and that's absolutely fine they're, they're, they're like the best in their field for a reason it doesn't mean i can't do that one day and it's just in your head learning to take inspiration and have aspirations. The difficult thing is with it, with looking at social media and looking at other things is that we are often very polarizing with our views. And what I mean by that is we're either productive or we're lazy. There's no, there's no in between with it. And I think that's maybe even the story of my life is that when I was in school, I was lazy. When I was a student in university, I was lazy. I only really made an effort with sports, had a messy bedroom and I wasn't very organized versus now it's the polar opposite in terms of trying to drive productivity. So mm. in my head, I'm either Homer Simpson or I'm Elon Musk. There's no, there's no in between with it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in either camp and I struggle with that as well. Mm. We need a word for it. Crazy. Homer Musk. No, crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can just be crazy. You're not lazy. You're not being productive. Yeah, you're just in a crazy, crazy. Yeah. What I'm trying to get is the scale. Though you never, you never just lazy or productive. There's, you can be in yeah, between. Yeah, crazy. Things. Or what's the other one? How crazy or productive? Productive. Productive. I prefer crazy. I won't lie. We can all have a bit of praise. Oh. <laughs> anyway, the question that I was going to ask you before, Ben. What? can you do to better or set boundaries for yourself? I definitely have a few in mind that I do to set boundaries in a work environment. You will have similar. Do you want me to say the couple that I've got in my head so you understand the gist of the question? This is what Lucy likes doing. She asks a question and then answers it herself. <laughs> yeah. So I, well, I just didn't know if you understood the... Uh, Ask me the question. and then What I can respond. you do better to set boundaries for yourself? Um, 
I think a few things I'd noted down of how to ease maybe the pressure of productivity, productivity, and I think that ties into your question a little bit is remember that everybody wakes up naked. Everybody takes a shit the same way. Or you wake up Everybody in gets dressed the same way. <laughs> You know, we're all human. No, nobody's a robot machine who doesn't also think about these things. Everybody has misbalances in life. Everybody sometimes works too much. Everybody sometimes is a little bit lazy. We all have these things, and we're all in in conflict with it. But remember, at the end of the day, we're all we're all human. I think is a one that really grounds me again. Mm-hmm. Um, that other thing that we spoke about before is trying to get balanced with being more content. So for me, having gratitude for some things and taking a look at what I've achieved this month is really beneficial for me. Self-care is actually a massive one. It's one of the things I really, really enjoy and takes me away from trying to be productive because I'm just working on things that make me feel better again. So when I go for my, when I go for a fresh fade on a Thursday, I feel a million bucks, even though we deal in pounds or, I know it sounds really weird, but even shave my legs, feel great. Doing, I, mean, I think that's it, across the board. Ha- having a shave, doing moisturizer, putting my beard oil in, feeling a bit fresh, ordering a new outfit. All little things like that, self-care for me, really makes me feel good. And I'm sure that works for a lot of people. I'm sure women especially will resonate with that. But I think more guys that do it as well, the better you will, you'll feel about it. Um... I'm trying to think of some non-negotiables that I always do that make me feel better about it or take that pressure away. Or more more so like setting boundaries. Yeah, okay. Non-negotiables that maybe set boundaries. Do you know what the thing that I've stopped doing that really helped with this? The unscheduled list. Because... Yeah, you did like... I did the, not like the, that. You loved it. The, the thing that I really liked about it was is that I'm, I was putting things in the diary that I wanted to prioritize and we often th- speak about and the thing that made me realize this was when we had James Clear on the podcast as well when I said one of my, my priorities is Lucy and he said well does does your diary and your schedule indicate that and I thought to myself it probably doesn't yeah and when I had the unscheduled list I would put things in my diary first that on not just work priorities, but a life priority. So I'd have in there date night with Lucy, which we still do. I'd have in there, um, go and play the Sims of an evening sometimes, drive back to my dad's to go and see my dad and watch the football. I'd have things in there for the week that I wanted to do first and put the reward in before the task. And then I'd put the task in around it because just like we, just, we spoke about then, even if I shortened the amount of time that I had to do the tasks, I'd still get it done within that time frame because I knew I was working up towards the reward that I wanted to get to as well. Mm-hmm. So the unscheduled sheet, you can I think you can download that on Google. I spoke about it a few times. You can go onto Google, type in unscheduled spreadsheet or unscheduled sheet, and you can download it and it will give you a, an example of what that looks like. But I found that really useful when I got into these periods of either toxic productivity or procrastination. You should maybe bring the sheet back out. Maybe. The sheet was actually a very good thing for you. Um, I was just going to say a few things in terms of setting boundaries for me. For example, I'm not very contact contactable a lot of the time. and I don't care if it pisses other people off. <laughs> you can basically on an iPhone, you can set your phones in different modes um, I have so many of them. I'm going to show Ben's camera. So I've got do not disturb, personal, sleep, reading, zone out, Sunday reset, work time, focus, fitness, and driving. What you can basically do, so in the work time focus one, there's only four people who can contact me. That's Ben, Cal, Kieran, and my manager. Four people. And I literally have that on all day. So if anyone personally meshes me in the day, you will not hear back from me because I've just not seen the message. Sunday reset. Um, nobody, can, nobody can contact me on Sunday reset day. I think my mum actually can. My mum, in case of emergencies, my mum is always kind of on them in case of emergency. Do not disturb. Not a single person. Mum's not even involved in that one. And I'm also just set myself these things like reading zone out. Nobody can contact me if I'm reading. You will not be able to get hold of me. Like the amount of times I have like ten missed calls from Ben, and he's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Oh, my phone was on this mode." 
as in like, I am not contactable. And that to me is a boundary. And it just helps with productivity so much because if I haven't got loads of people pinging and messaging me when I'm working, it's only Cal, Kieran, Ben or my manager, everything else in that moment is not relevant to me or how it's going to help me move forward. The fitness one, very important because a lot of people get distracted on their phone during training. Um, only one person at the moment can contact me and that's my coach. So when I'm training and I've got fitness mode on, I will not see a single message. I used to be really bad on runs. The amount of runs that I've probably voice noted like Cal or Ben or so I'm like, I used to work whilst running, didn't I? And I just, yeah, that was you ever had, really weird. For, yeah. I used to voice note on runs and reply to work emails whilst running. How fucking crazy is that? And I used to speak into my phone cause I'd be so stressed about it cause they were pinging through fitness mode. Not a single soul except my coach can contact me. Um, so they're amazing boundaries that I set myself that work in all different areas. And I just, I don't, I don't really do m much more than that, to be honest. That to me is like phone free time because I'm not really on it that much. I'm just not contactable. And I think if you're quite a busy person, you do have a lot on, you do have to set those boundaries to yourself in terms of when you're contactable and when you're not. It's not a bad thing that people can't contact you 24 seven. You're allowed a bit of time away like off it. it means I'm not on socials. I don't really do anything. I think I just think it's a really good method that I've used that I don't know if other people would also find super productive for themselves. Yeah, no, I agree. That's a good one. It's, it's Without one of the distracted ones, time. It's one of the ones that I struggle with because I was even speaking to the guy who owns the gym yesterday when, or the day before when I was training there about taking laptops on holiday and I always say, oh, you know, I'm not going to take it, but then I worry in case I miss something. I'd always take my laptop. Yeah, but yeah. Like that's something I've never... I think due to our role, it's, it's important, but it's always a missed promise to myself. I think the other thing, the other two things that just come to mind is communication. I think it was only on Monday with a, we've just been speaking about before, a large project I've had on for sort of the last six months. It, it's sometimes in my role, I think I'm a bit of a shit filter in terms of filtering stuff, making sure that other stuff doesn't get to people uh, in the team. And sometimes that's quite heavy. And I don't know, we spoke about the other day. And sometimes you're communicating things is makes things feel a lot easier. And one of the things that we've just spoken about probably in the last two hours is if we've got big lists of things to do, obviously prioritizing things is a really easy mm -hmm. thing that you can do. And then instead of trying to half arse everything or tick every box, because I'm guilty of this a lot of the time is just focus on quality over quantity because you'll always come out with a better product or a better result that you've spent the time on one thing and then communicate either with yourself or with, or with someone else that I can't get these other things done. It's like, it's fine. Cause the other thing yeah. we do, we put, we allow time to be such a pressure on ourselves. I think time stresses so many people out that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, no one's going to die if you don't finish it or don't do it. It's, and I think as long as we communicate things, it, it takes the pressure away from us. So even I was thinking deeply about this today, but quality over quantity is a really easy thing yeah. to think about. And I did it yesterday with my own task list when I just said I was balls deep in just, just focusing on, on email to make sure that I got the things right that I needed to do. And often I write up a big task list and stress myself out about it. Yeah, you can even relay that over to fitness, of course, like quality sessions over just like hammering yourself into the ground and not really doing anything and just kind of, meeting numbers and things like that but actually there's no quality in that session and improvements that's when you will start to burn out and you won't progress because you're doing so much but there's not much quality in it um another really important point but that was every single point that i had written down today i also think we've been yeah. over a lot and, and i, I don't want to overwhelm yeah. people I, I think some obviously there's, there's <laughs> a lot of negative points of in here but also don't forget that if you if you do want to achieve anything, you often have to do things that you don't mm -hmm. want to do. It's not always going, oh, you just chill out and do nothing. It's not that. Like it, it's just about not being too much one way. Yeah. Uh, but at certain points and certain times, it's going to have to be sacrificed to do anything that's worthwhile. And you have to sacrifice certain pleasures in order to, to sometimes Jeez. optimize. But just don't forget you're not in con contest with the rest of the world. Absolutely. And we hope you enjoyed today's episode and took a lot away from it. I mean, we I had an epiphany in that episode, clearly. My brain absolutely just fell off. One more thing oh, that we can include the link in. I don't, it could be sold out by the time we've announced this because it's going up today. I know the podcast won't go up until next Monday, but we are running a really cool uh, workout and workshop. It's going to well be on, sold out. <laughs> yeah, Saturday the 20th of July. 
So it's with me, Lucy, and Hunter McIntyre. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in the Northwest. It's going to be at Empowered Gym. I think it starts at 9 a.m. We will leave the link below in the show notes. It's going to be a one-hour workout with myself and Lucy, and I think it's a two- to three-hour seminar with Hunter McIntyre, and I've witnessed this seminar before, and it's really Fantastic. good. I know sometimes two or three hours sounds like a long time, but he's he's also almost like a bit of a stand-up comedian. He's, he's yeah, really he's interesting good. to listen to as well as having his wealth of knowledge. There'll also be snacks and free protein shakes there, yes. challenges, goodies. Workout. I said that. You mentioned that. I was not listening. <laughs> the lot. So if you want to check more out about that, uh, the link will be in the show notes, but I can't promise there'll still be tickets left for it. Yeah, I feel like you've really, Sorry. really annoyed people there. But if you do like those events, obviously we can put more on like that as well. So just let us know. But we hope you love today's episode, took a lot away from it. As always, we appreciate you so much when you subscribe to the YouTube, the Spotify. I don't know what you do with Apple anymore. I think you can subscribe. I'm not 100% sure with Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate your, com your comments on the YouTube channel. There was lots yeah. on last week's episode about or the previous week's episode about body dysmorphia. Mm -hmm. And we do read them all as well. And we really appreciate them. Yes. And on that note, we will catch you next week. Bye, guys. Bye.